Hello again. So we are going to start chapter 12, which involves chemical kinetics. And right, chemical kinetics are an area of chemistry that concerns reaction rates. So how quickly do reactions happen? But not all reactions occur in a timely fashion. And so it helps if we know what's called the reaction mechanism. These are the steps by which the reaction takes place. And if we know the steps by which the reaction takes place, then we can help find ways to facilitate a reaction, maybe make certain steps go faster, take advantage of those things. So this is, is a really important part to the industry of chemistry. So let's talk about uh, reaction rates first of all. So a rate is a change in a given quantity over time. So uh, if you remember from physics, velocity is the rate at which distance is covered over time. So rate is anything divided by time. Well, a reaction rate specifically for chemistry is the change in concentration of either the reactant or the product over time. And we can write this by using uh, delta A. Let me get my pen. A, so delta concentration of A divided by the change in time. Uh, A represents either the reactant or the product that we are considering. Uh, these brackets represent the concentration, so moles per liter, and then our delta represents change. Remember, anytime you see delta, it's change. It's final minus initial. This can be positive or de negative depending on whether we have a reactant or a product. In the beginning of a reaction, we have lots of reactant, no product. And then at the end of a reaction, we might have a little bit of reactant left depending on the to reactant, things like that if the reaction goes completion, and then we'll have lots of product. So the change here, since we have final minus initial, is going to be negative. And the change here, since we're taking final minus initial, is going to be positive. So it can be positive or negative depending on if you're talking about a reactant or product. However, in chemistry, we like to make things a little easier. You may not think so all the time, but it's true. Um, and so we try to make the rate positive all the time. So what this means for reactants then is that we're going to put a negative in front of the rate. Because the rate is already going to be negative, we know a negative times a negative gives us a positive. And so just remember that for reactants. We can also talk about instantaneous rate, which is the rate at a particular point in time, just like instantaneous velocity is the velocity at a particular point in time. And in order to do this, you need the slope of the line that is tangent to the curve. So let's say this is our curve, okay, and we're plotting concentration over time. Well, since N2O5 is a reactant in this case, we start out with a lot, we end up with a little bit. And so let's say we wanted the, um, oops, the rate at a particular point in time. And so we would have, here's our um, tangent line. We're going to find that slope, and it'll give us that particular point in time. And so we can also find slope by taking the change in y over the change in x. And where's my pen? There it is. That's what they're doing right here. And so since y is concentration and x is time, we get the same, um, the same rate that we talked about before. Stoichiometry is also going to be important here. helps determine relative rates. It doesn't determine the actual rate. We have to calculate that, but it determines relative rates of consumption of reactant and generation of product. So if we take a look at this equation, because we've got a 2 in front of the NO2 and a 2 in front of the NO, we can say that they are produced at the same rate as NO2 is consumed. Now the difference you should see is that there's a 1 in front of the O2, and so what that means is that O2 is produced half as fast as the NO. And so we're, we can get relative rates from the stoichiometry. If we wanted to write the rate equation, here's our negative because this is our reactant. Change in the concentration over change in time. Because O2 is produced half as fast, we've got a 2 in front to make them equal because the rate of O2 is actually going to be less, so we're multiplying by 2. Alright, so now let's talk about rate laws, which is we're going to take what we, the rate and turn it into what's called a rate law. Okay, reactions are reversible. We can go one direction, but we can also turn those products into reactants and go the other way. And if we take both of those directions into account, eventually the rate is going to depend on the difference in the rates of the forward and reverse reactions, because we're going to have first a lot of reactants, then we're going to produce product, then we go back and forth, and that can get kind of complicated. 
So to make things a little more simple, again, here we're making things simpler, um, we're going to study the reaction after the reactants are mixed, but before the products build up too much to kind of become a problem. This means that the reaction rate is really only going to depend on the concentration of the reactants. Because remember, these brackets mean concentration. And so we can write the rate. Uh, rate is equal to K times concentration of R to the superscript of N. And this is called the rate law. It shows how the rate depends on the concentration. So here's our rate and here's our concentration and we're relating them to each other. K is called a rate constant. You can either solve for it given everything else or it can be given to you. N is the order of the reactant. It can be an integer including the zero or it can be a fraction. And both of these values are determined by experiment or if you know all the rest you could determine K and we'll talk about how to do that. And it's also very important to define what is meant by rate. Which reactant or product are you talking about when you talk about this concentration piece here? Um, and so it, it will always be clearly stated which reactant or product is being, uh, the rate is being determined by. So let's, there are two main types of rate laws. First is the differential rate. This is, um, shows how rate depends on concentration. So rate and concentration are going to be really important in this one. That's the two things we're comparing. The integrated rate law shows how concentration depends on time. And these two are related. So if you know one, you can find the other. And so you might be asking yourself, well, how do we know which one to, to find first? Well, you're going to choose the one uh, based on ease of data collection. So if it is easier in your experiment, because remember, we said K and N had to be determined through experimentation. So if it's easier to collect rate and concentration data, then you would do the differential rate law. If it's easier to collect concentration and time data, you would do the integrated rate law. So it depends on what you've got available to you. So these rate laws, and the reason why this is important, going back to the beginning, give information on the steps by which the reactant occurs. And so we said that it was really important to know the steps by which the reaction occurred because that would help us kind of determine how things react and maybe take advantage of certain steps. So this is a way to get that information. So let's determine the form of the rate law. So first let's look at a first order rate of reaction. So we've got this equation and in order to find rates, the instantaneous rates, we're going to take the slope of the tangent at two points along the curve. So again, um, just in case you had forgotten, here's how you find that. And they've already done it for us. So um, at a rate of 5.4 times 10 to the negative fourth, our concentration was 0.9 molar. And later on, our concentration was 0.45 molar. And our rate was 2.7 times 10 to the negative fourth. Remember, that's moles, so concentration per second. Moles per liter seconds. OK, so if we take a look at this, from 0 0.0, 0 .0 sorry, from 0.9 to 0.45, we're having the concentration. And when we have the concentration, we also have the rate. So these are related. Okay? And that means that the rate of reaction depends on the concentration to the first power, or n equals 1. And we'll look at an example for how we get this in more detail in a minute. So what that means is if we want to write the rate, it's because N2O5 is a reactant, it's negative change in the concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide divided by the change in time, and then if we turn that into a rate law, we've got our rate constant times the concentration of our reactant. Here's n equals 1. Well, since n equals 1, we don't have to put anything. Okay? It's kind of like when you're balancing an equation. We can turn this into the general form of rate is equal to the constant times the concentration, A representing some reactant or product, and this is for first order reactions. This will be your general form. So let's look at how we determine that. Okay, the initial rate is the instantaneous rate just after a reaction begins. We try to um, go just after t equals zero. So we can take uh, do several experiments with different initial concentrations, and then we determine the initial rate for each of those experiments, and then we compare all of that data to see how the rate depends on concentration. 
So instead of, you know, taking the instantaneous from the graph, we do different experiments and look at the initial concentrations of each one. So let's look at an example of that. So we have our equation here, and we can write our rate as the change in ammonium ion divided by the change in time, and our rate law is K times the concentration of ammonium ion to the n power times the concentration of our other reactant to the m power. Okay, so we can determine the n and m by seeing how the initial rate depends on the initial concentrations of ammonium and the uh, NO2 minus. Okay, so from experiment one to two, now let's just make some observations first before we start looking at experiment one and two. Okay. So let's take a look at experiment one and two. Hopefully what you notice is that the concentration of ammonium ion is not changing at all. So now let's look at the concentration of NO2 minus ion. Well, you can see from experiment one to two, it looks like we're doubling. And if you look at our rate, we're also doubling. And if you remember from before, when the concentration doubled and the rate doubled, we said that that was first order. However, here we've got two reactants, so let's see how that um, plays a part. Okay, so our concentration of NH4 plus is the same, but our NO2 concentration doubles and the rate doubles. This means it's first order. Now here's the math that's going on. We're taking our rate 2 divided by rate 1. Here's those rates. Okay, here's our rate law. Here's our concentration of NH4. Here's our concentration of NO2. These are going to cancel out because they're the same on the numerator denominator and everything's being multiplied together. And so what that means is we only have these two left for our NO2 minus ion. And if we take our rate 2 divided by rate 1, we get 2. And so we're dividing these. That's giving us 2 also to the M. So here's our division of rate 2 over rate 1. Here's our division of the concentrations. And so if we divide 2 by 2, that gives us that, M is 1. Okay, so that's where all the math is coming from, but we are kind of just looking for a pattern based on your data. All right, if we look at experiment 2 to 3, now let's just go back real quick and check that out. Okay, if we look from experiment 2 to 3, what we can see is that the concentration of ammonia is now going to double, and the concentration of NO2 minus 1 is going to stay the same. And if we look between the rates of experiment 2 and 3, they are also doubling. And so we have a similar pattern. Okay, one is staying the same, not being affected at all. The other reactant is doubling. And that's kind of what you're looking for. They're both changing at the same time. It's really hard to see how one is being affected versus the other. Right, let's go back then. Okay, so as you can see from experiment 2 to 3, the concentration of ammonia is going to double. But now NO2 is staying the same. And so this means that it is first order in terms of our ammonium ion, whereas when we looked at experiment 1 to 2, it was first order in terms of NO2 1 minus. So what this means is that we can write our rate law as rate equals K times the concentration of ammonia to the first power times the concentration of our NO2 ion to the first power as well. And so if we want overall reaction order, we need to add up all of the powers. And so we take the sum of N and M, and we get 2. 1 plus 1 gives us second order. So this is a second order reaction overall. All right. So here are some things to get you started, and then we will talk about this more in class. Have a good day.